Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Xavier René Corail. As you can hear from my accent, I'm French. Um, so today we'll talk about security as code. So uh, I'm the senior director of the GitHub Security Lab. Uh, what we do at the GitHub Security Lab is that we help secure open source software, uh, all open source software. So how we do that? Our core activity is a security audit in open source projects. We find vulnerabilities in these projects. We disclose them to the maintainers. We help the maintainers fix them. And we do that for all uh, open source, well, I mean, any open source project, uh, not only those that we are using at GitHub, not even only those who are hosted on GitHub, any open source project. Um, but of course, we cannot secure the open source by ourselves. So being at GitHub, we leverage the power of the community. So how do we do that? One, we educate the community. So we share our security techniques and our security findings with uh, the security research community. And we, um, we try also to educate the open source community. We give them security tips, secure code tips, security best practices. We also host uh, office hours for maintainers to help them, uh, well, to answer their questions and help them adopt a better security posture. Two, we amplify security research. So we do variant analysis. Whenever we find a noticeable CVE or security vulnerability, we try to code this pattern uh, with a code QL, and we try to run the query on all open source projects to find other instances of this vulnerability. And finally, we notify the ecosystem. So we are a CNA, so we assign CVEs for security vulnerabilities in open source. And we also create the GitHub Advisory Database, which is the free and open source database for security vulnerabilities in open source. What I want to do today is convince you of the benefits of using security as code. So I will first introduce the concept. I will show you um, how, well, what it looks like concretely with uh, CodeQL. And then hopefully we'll have time for questions afterwards. So my story begins far, far away uh, on planet Mars. 10 years ago, uh, Meet Rover, it's a, well, curiosity, sorry, it's a rover uh, developed by NASA JPL. And uh, 10 years ago, this uh, small rover was en route to Mars. Well, not very small. Uh, here you can see a few humans next to the rover to see the real size of it. Uh, and what happened once it was already uh, going to Mars is that the NASA JPL engineering team found a bug in the, um, um, in the piece of code that was in charge of the parachute uh, during the landing phase. So pretty, uh, pretty critical uh, piece of code. This is, um, let's dig into this, uh, this bug. So this is not NASA's real code. This is pseudocode that I've written for you to explain what it's about. So in C, if you declare a function parameter as an array of size 12 here, an array of doubles of size 12 here, it doesn't prevent you to call this function with an array of different size. So this is what's happening on line eight, we are calling this function with an array of doubles of size three. What happens if you look at line three during the processing of this function, what happens is that the system will access memory space that is beyond the allocated memory space and then the result will be unpredictable. You don't know what's in this space. So we found this bug. Uh, we checked that it was not mm, very, very, uh, harmful, but they thought, hey, what if this bug is happening in other places in our software? After a quick code review, they found, quickly found another place where this was happening. So they said, okay, hold on. Um, we'll need to find all instances of this bug. And so we will use an automatic static analysis tool to find all of these instances. And so they used CodeQL to find all instances of this pattern in their code. 
So this is an example of this query. Um, if you look at the third line, um, you see that we are looking for an, the argument in position, in position i, and that this argument in position i has, uh, well, it's an array, and that has a size a. And then we are comparing this to the parameter of the function declaration in position i, same position i, and you see that it's also an array of size b. And we compare this size and we see that a is smaller than b. We have coded uh, the pattern of our bug. So they run this query on their code, and they found more than 20 instances of the same bug in their code. And a handful of these instances were critical and would be causing a crash. Uh, and here I'm talking about a physical crash of the rover <laughs> on the surface, not a software crash. So what they did is that they fixed that, and of course they deployed the code remotely to uh, Curiosity. Curiosity was already going to Mars, but they deployed remotely on the rover, and the rest is history. Um, Fast forward nine years later, NASA sent another rover on Mars, Perseverance. And um, here again, they used CodeQL into their uh, security testing uh, uh, routine so that Perseverance also landed safely on Mars. But they did things a bit differently this time. What did they do differently is that no more late code reviews, no more late security testing, no more patching in production. They included all of that into their software development lifecycle. Um, and well, as much as we would all love to uh, follow NASA's example and shift left security to include all of that into the development lifecycle, some companies some organizations struggle with that, apparently. In a recent survey of about the state of DevSecOps, 43% of respondents say that they were frustrated that security testing was done late in the software development lifecycle. So uh, what can we do to help this company? I mean, what could this company do to effectively uh, include security testing into their SDLC. I propose you to look back at the success of DevOps and get the lessons learned from DevOps. How did DevOps succeed in, in, uh, in being deployed in organizations? I think that the key factor, the key success factor for that is empowering developers. You need to empower your developers to adopt these practices Right? And to do that, you need three things. In his book, Drive, Daniel Pink said that every one of us, to be motivated to do something, we need three things. Well, no, in fact, we first need to be paid enough, and once that is off the table, we need three things. Autonomy, mastery, and purpose. This is what drives us to do something. This is what drives our motivation. So what would that mean for security testing? Let's try to see what it would mean. So autonomy. Autonomy would mean that you're in control. As a developer, you can run your tests when you want. You can act on the results. Right? You are autonomous to do that. The opposite would be that another team is running the test for you and then creates a bunch of issues and then send all the issues to you, right? I remember one former colleague telling me, oh wow, hey, my security tool, they finally moved from uh, generating a PDF and now they are integrating with Jira. And oh, developers will love it. And mm, well, uh, uh, as much as we can all uh, agree that moving from PDF to issues, is, it's an improvement. Um, but developers didn't love it, right? They, they were still not autonomous. Mastery. Mastery is being able to learn in the process, right? 
So you are you know, acquiring a new scale learning. So for security testing, that would be that developers in this security, during this security testing process, they learn about some secure code practices. They are able to learn and to not repeat uh, the mistakes, the same mistakes uh, in the future. The contrary would be that the expertise stays in that other team and doesn't benefit the developers. And finally, purpose. Well, the purpose of a developer, right, that would be to, um, um, to, to, to create a delightful software for their, uh, for their users, right? We all know that. So high quality and uh, high security, too, right? They should be able to relate what they are doing to this purpose, right? So they should be able to say, oh, okay, I know why I need to fix this thing. It's, I can relate it to this purpose, right? But if you just do what you're told to, hey, fix that thing, you don't have this relation and it doesn't work. So yeah, I think that we should empower developers as a key success factor to deploy DevSecOps practices. And how do we empower developers? Well, we give them code. This is what they do, right? Um, let's see some examples of the past again, right? Uh, when I needed to deploy practices such as functional testing with developers, what worked was when they were able to code it themselves with tools like fitness and Selenium. DevOps, when we wanted to include uh, deployment testing and probability testing, what worked was infrastructure as code. This, this is really what ticked and made them adopt these practices, infrastructure as code. So why not security as code? Security as code would be well, I took this uh, definition from um, the web, but basically what, I'm, what I want to do is um, that the developers are able to code their security testing, their security checks, right? And with that, you get automation, you get uh, repeatability, you get uh, reusability, you get documentation, right? Same as infrastructure as code, but with security. You get all of these benefits. And this is where I introduce CodeQL. So CodeQL is a way to code your security checks. It's a SAS, a static analysis security testing tool, which means that it will run static analysis on your code. It will not run your program. QL stands for query language. It's kind of SQL for code. It will query your code as if it's data. With this language, you describe what to find and not how to find it. It's very expressive in this way. And it's a logical declarative language based on data log. And it's also object oriented, which is super useful for reusability. We will see that later. A bit more into details, CodeQL works in two phases. First phase, it will extract your code into a relational database. It will extract all aspects of your code, like the abstract syntax tree, some semantics, and even the control flow graph. And then it gives you an optimized object-oriented language that will ab abstract SQL, right, to query this DB. Um, yeah, so on the diagram on the left, you see a bit more these two phases, extraction and then query. Now let's have a look at the first example. So what happens behind the hood is that in the DB we have a table that has been created that is named function. And in this table, you have a colon called name. Um, and then you have all the, the function declarations in this table. And CodeQL created a class on top of that. So you have a class function that maps the table uh, called function. And you, in this class, you have a member name that you can access with get name that maps the name colon. If you look at the second example, you'll see that we are able, like in SQL, to do a join between two tables. So here, the functions and the functions calls. And this join is made super easily with the line nc.target equals f, right? So we are binding the target of the call with the function. We can also access directly the first argument of the call with c.getArgument. 
So here, you see that it's abstracting the SQL, right? And it gives you a language that is more expressive, something that you can read in plain English, right? Um, so with CodeQL, you have support for all of these languages. Uh, there is also C Sharp that is missing on this slide, and you, we have also uh, Swift and Kotlin uh, that are in beta right now. So for each language, we need a bit of work to support it because the CodeQL team needs to design the optimal um, data schema. We need to uh, design the extractor that transforms your code into a DB. We need also to provide the, the um, fundamental uh, la uh, libraries, uh, like the control flow graph, for example. So each new language um, requires a bit, of, uh, a bit of work. So it's not a one fits all. And then, so once you have uh, the code query queries, the code query queries are open source, and you can have two possible ways. You can just consume them, right? The queries are there open source. You can just run them on your code or you can be a writer. If you choose to consume, um, well, this is super easy. You can really immediately benefit from these queries because um, if you are a, an open source project, it's free for you. It's free for all open source projects, not only the projects that are hosted on GitHub. <clears throat> if you are on GitHub, though, you can also have free inclusion of this into your CI CD, and it's one click easy. You go to your GitHub project and you enable CodeQL. This is a one click configuration. And once you do that, you will have CodeQL running uh, on your project automatically. And for example, CodeQL will analyze all your new pull requests and it will comment on it. So here, for example, you have a new code popping up, and you have a code query, a code query analysis telling you that there is a possible uh, uh, client-side cross-site uh, XSS in your code. So um, here, as you can see, it's, it's really acting as if you had a peer reviewer telling you, hey, I think there is a problem here in your code. So it's, it's not changing anything from what you usually do. It's included into your software development lifecycle, right? Um, you can also, from your IDE, get these, uh, uh, um, these alerts and then be able to code the fix immediately. If you click on show more details here, you will have a detailed explanation of the vulnerability that will educate you about this, uh, um, uh, this vulnerability. You will get a remediation advice. So, as a developer, you will be able to act on it immediately and autonomously. Um, and of, yes, this documentation is also um, customizable because as I said, the queries are open source. So you can you know, kind of adapt them to your particular, the particular case of your code, of your project, your organization, to get your developers really doing the right thing uh, uh, for this uh, particular vulnerability. And now, if you are a writer, then I've got a demo for you. Imagine that um, you're an open source maintainer. Yeah, you're the open source maintainer of a popular Java library. Let's say Log4j, completely randomly. Uh, and then you heard about this vulnerability pattern, a GNDI injection. So you want to make sure that your library is not vulnerable to that. What would that be in your case? It would be that an attacker can use your logging functionality where he can pass a, they, they can pass a string, and then this string will perform a GNDI, a GNDI lookup in a remote server. What does that look like? So for example, it means that here you have an attacker who can control this message here. In this message, they will pass a GNDI lookup, and this will end up into this file, GNDI manager.java, into this call to context lookup, into this argument name. 
Okay, so what I will do is that I will try to show you how we find this pattern with CodeQL in, uh, in, in Log4j. So I'm in uh, Visual Studio Code, and what I did is that uh, I installed the CodeQL extension here. All of this is, is free for open source. Um, and then, as I told you, with CodeQL, you have to do two phases. You generate the code base, and then you query this code base. So I've used the CodeQL CLI to generate uh, the um, log4j library here, and I imported it into my workspace. So now I can run queries on it. Okay, so for example, here I got a query that looked for empty statement block, and I can run it. But that's not what is interesting for me. What I want to find, I want to find this um, message here. Okay, so one thing that is super useful is that uh, in CodeQL, you, in, in this extension, you also have the AST, the AST viewer here that gives you the name you know, of the classes that CodeQL is mapping your code with. So for example, here, the method, well, the class that I need to query is called method. Cool. This parameter here, well, it's called a parameter. And for example, this is an annotation. OK, cool. Very useful, right? Some of the names are pretty intuitive. But in some cases, it's very useful to use this AST viewer to know what you are querying. OK, so let's do that. I want to find um, the, parameter, the first parameter of a method that overrides um, logger.info. So, look for, so here, as you can see, my friend Copilot is kicking in and helping me. I won't lie, I will use it because it's so super useful. So I'm looking for a method that overrides logger.info, yes, it tells me that because I practiced, of, of course, so, okay, well. And has a car sequence parameter, yes, please. Okay, so from method m and, oop, okay, and parameter p, let's see. Um, so my method is overriding logger.info, my method has one parameter, this parameter is p, and the type of p is Car sequence. Okay, yes, I think this is what I want. And then select, uh, no, I don't want to select the method, I want to select the parameter. Okay, let's run this query. Okay, one result. If I click on it, boom, this is exactly what I was looking for. Okay, cool. Now, what I want is um, this one. I want the first argument um, of a call to a method called lookup. And uh, this method is a member of a class that uh, implements uh, Jabax namings.context. Okay. Now what we'll do, we will ask Copilot to write, to, to write that for us. So look. Uh, for a method call uh, that implements, well, method call of a method called lookup. Um, and the uh, method is declared in a class that is a subtype of Java naming context. Yes, okay. Uh, and select the first argument. Okay, so from, let's see, from method access method, I'm binding the two. The name of the method is lookup, and the declaring type, which is the class where this number is, um, is implementing Jabax naming context. Well, this is exactly what I want. And I will, yes, yeah, select the first argument. Here, I need to comment this bit here. 
OK. And I will run this query. OK, I've got two results. If I click on the first one, it's in data source connection source.java. This is not what I'm looking for. But this one is exactly the one I'm looking for. I mean, JNDI manager.java, and I've got my, uh, my first argument. Cool. OK, so what I did now, I found these two places in the, in the code. But what I want to know is, is there a possibility that this uh, untrusted source, right, that, that an, an attacker can pass to the logging functionality, is this a possibility that this data here can flow to the JNDI lookup? Let's ask CodeQL, CodeQL about that. How do we do that? CodeQL has a chain tracking default library that you can reuse. This library will tell you if there is a potential flow between a source and what we call a sync. And for that, this library comes with a boilerplate code. In this code, you just have to complete uh, the definition of what you consider as an untrusted source here with this predicate, is source, and what you consider as being uh, a dangerous sync with implementing this predicate is sync. So let's use that. I will copy this boilerplate code into um, my file here. I will command this part, and uh, I will copy the code here. OK, and now let's implement is source and is sync. Well, we already implemented them, in fact, right? The source is uh, this parameter of logger.info. So let me copy that here. Boom, I will uncomment. And so if there is a method M and a parameter P, such as this method overrides logger info, this method has one parameter, this parameter is P and of type char sequence. And I have to say that my source is uh, my parameter. So here I've got a problem because source is not of the good type, so I need to cast it as parameter. Okay. So here, what I will do is that I will evaluate this predicate to make sure that I've got the same result um, as before, just to be sure. Yes, we have the same result. OK, cool. Uh, let's go back. OK, so we have implemented our source. Good. Now we have to implement our sync. What do we do? Well, we should copy what is in here into the sync. But no, there is a simpler way. Remember that queries are open source, um, and it's an object-oriented language. So because of that, the community, um, people from the community, are providing you know, uh, queries, but also some libraries and some classes uh, and that we can reuse. It happens that a community contributor created a class called JNDI injection sync. Hmm. I think that I will use this one. So I will say, yeah, sync, my sync is an instance of this class JNDI injection sync. Let's quickly evaluate to make sure that, okay, this class is coming from the community. I'm not really sure if that uh, does what I want. Oh, so see, it's not doing exactly the same thing, right? Uh, it gives me five results in, instead of the, of the two ones that I had. So it's less precise than what I had before. But this one here is exactly the one that I'm looking for. So let's use it, right? Uh, let's, let's trade this, this uh, precision for simplicity. And let's use that. So now I have implemented my source and my sync. I will run the query to see what I get. And boom, I've got a result. 
let's look at the results. So CodeQL found four different paths between this source and this sink. Let's look at one of them. So here, indeed, the first step of this path, I can see that it's my parameter here. And then if I take the second step, it goes just one, uh, one line below here. And then certainly it will go to log if, the definition of log if enabled, yes, etc., etc. And it goes across multiple steps, across multiple functions, across multiple files even, <laughs> down to the call to uh, my GNDI lookup. So you see more than 100 steps. If we look at this other path here, so same thing, you have 150 steps, right? So this is something that is uh, impossible to, to find manually, right? Even if you're Elon Musk and you have code review superpower and you can read pages and pages of printed code, uh, you cannot do that, you cannot beat that. So <laughs> this is the way that you can use CodeQL to find paths across uh, a, a whole of your code. Here I want to mention one thing. I, the, the minimal thing that you have to do for this thin tracking configuration is to define a source and a sync, right? And the library is already pretty good to, uh, to give you nice results. But you have control of your ten tracking, total control. How? Because you can also implement two other predicates. One, where you can define sanitizers. You can say, hey, when you're passing through this call, then it's sanitizing the data. So stop your ten tracking here. Don't go, th don't go through. The other side, right? On the other side, you can say the opposite and say, hey, imagine, for example, that you are calling an external framework that you don't know about, right? I mean, CodeQL doesn't know about this code, then you can say, hey, I'm adding a taint step. I want you to continue the taint uh, uh, when I pass through this call because it's tainting my, my data. So for example, you can say, hey, I want to, to have a taint between the first argument of this call and the return value, or the first argument of, of this call and that member of that argument of this call, I want you to propagate the taint. So that gives you really total control of, uh, your, of your taint tracking. You can, with sanitizers, reduce false positives. You can, with additional taint steps, reduce false negatives, right? So the minimal configuration by just defining source and async is already pretty good, but know that you have full control uh, on the taint tracking um, um, feature. So that's it. We found log for shell with, uh, with CodeQL. That's Pretty cool. Let's go back to our slides. So, so yeah, well, time for the conclusion. So with security as code uh, and with CodeQL, you get an automated, repeatable, reusable uh, uh, security check that you can include seamlessly into your software development lifecycle. And if you're a developer, when you get that, you know, it's code. So uh, I can read it, I can understand, I can learn from it. There is a documentation attached to it, so I can really learn from it even more. And there is also a bonus, is that because the code query queries are open source, you get community-driven security checks. What I mean by that is that these queries, they are written by the code query uh, team at GitHub. They are written by my team, the security lab. They are written by security teams uh, at our customers. They are written by dozens of independent security, res security researchers who are contributing to, the co to, this, to these code query queries. So with that, you get an, a knowledge uh, coming from the community that is wider and that is more diverse than any in-house team could get you. So that's the bonus of, the, of, the, of having these uh, queries being uh, community driven. Uh, and that is, if you want to know more, you can browse codeql.com. You can go to uh, the website of the security lab. On this website, you will find 
uh, access to our public Slack, to our community Slack. You will find some um, examples of how we used CodeQL. You will find also um, some CodeQL CTFs that you can, you know, uh, uh, play with to, to learn about CodeQL. And uh, you can also uh, visit GitHub at the booth G17. Thank you. I think we're right on time, but perhaps we have time for one or two questions. Yes? So, no, um, how does that play? Yeah, does it use it all? Like, is it part of well? Oh, no, no. So, so the question is, uh, how is uh, GPT uh, playing into CodeQL? So, no, a CodeQL is pretty uh, deterministic. You know, it just analyze your code, put all of that into a database, and then look for, uh, look for uh, uh, you know, the, uh, analyze your control flow graph, et cetera. So I was just using Copilot to write the code that does the query. Now, if you go to the, uh, to the CodeQL uh, site, you will see that uh, I, I think we, we, we run a beta about, uh, to use uh, machine learning to uh, identify more automatically some sources and some sinks, right? So we have a, we have a bit of, of, uh, of uh, machine learning that helps with uh, defining sources and sinks automatically, but it's, uh, it's still in beta. Uh, and no, we, so we're not using uh, GPT inside of the, of, the, of, of the query itself, if that makes sense. No more questions? Okay, so see you around. Thank you. <laughs>